today's episode is about RV winterization. So that's winterizing the fresh water system in your RV. And this has to be done. This time of year, you cannot let your water lines in your RV freeze. Otherwise, you will have very expensive problems to deal with come springtime. I want to welcome you to the show. This is Eric Stark with Radio Arizona RV, your best RV podcast. This podcast is for men, it's for women, it's for young, it's for old. It's for anybody who likes to do their own work on their RV or just likes to know how things work on their RV. And that's important that you understand how things work. Every day I come across someone who comes in my store, gives me a phone call about something, and they've always learned a little bit more when they do it themselves. Things that they're like, oh, I didn't know that's how that worked. That could have saved me 50 bucks. So they get it. They understand. So that's what the show is all about, helping you understand things better. Today's episode is number 76, and it's about RV winterization. Now, don't forget to share this episode with your friends, your family. If you ever have any questions, feel free to call me, contact me using the contact us page at RadioArizonaRV.com. And I, like I always say, I have a brick and mortar retail store, several websites where I sell products, and you can find links to these websites at RadioArizonaRV.com. And I do not sell everything that I talk about on the websites for one reason or another. But if you ever have questions about something, if you can't find it on a website or more information, feel free to contact me. I haven't said anything about the COVID-19 for a couple episodes now. And I do want to say that the RV industry is still lagging behind and getting caught up with production and getting the pipeline filled with RV parts. It's an interesting thing. and. I don't know if going into wintertime is going to help. I think it would because most RV stores will slow down quite a bit in the winter, whereas Arizona, Florida, Texas, states like that pick up some. But there's not going to be as many people traveling. The winter visitors from Canada aren't going to be coming to the states from what I understand. So this might give the manufacturers in the RV industry, whether it's parts, accessories, or RVs, to get some time to get caught up and maybe ahead a little bit. And the projection for next year, 2021, is supposed to be better than 2020 as far as new sales go. So the manufacturers hopefully are reading those projections and thinking, hmm, we need to get it together this time, COVID or no COVID, and make sure we can supply the the United States with RV parts for everybody who wants to go out and travel, right? Because it can be a real hassle when you have to settle for something you don't want or it's not the exact item you're looking for or you can't get it at all. I mean, there are some things that we've been out of for months and it doesn't look like we're ever going to get them. And we're, we don't sit back and just wait. We try to find things from anybody we can. If we can find an alternative brand and have to buy them ourselves, you know, direct from a manufacturer, buy more, spend more. We do that if it makes sense. It's been tough, but you know, we've got through it. We've done pretty well this year. We've kept our inventory up as fat as we possibly could where we could. But next year might be a different story. Let's wait and see. Hopefully the RV manufacturers, parts, accessories, and everything will actually get it together and make sure that the the pipeline is full and keep prices down. You know, COVID has been a reason to raise prices too. So hopefully prices don't increase and go crazy through the roof. I know they have in some industries, some products, some things, you know, cars, trucks, utility trailers, you know, prices are going up. All right, enough about all that. Winterizing your RV. So this is episode number 76. And remember that you can check out these episodes at RadioArizonaRV.com. And like last week, or excuse me, the last episode I did, which just happened to be last week, I did one on the uh, Energizer ARC-5 portable power station. And in that episode, I have the link to an information page on that product. We're one of the few people in the U.S. that is selling it right now. So you can go there and click on that link, and it'll take you an information page. And it's also on ArizonaRVPartsCenter.com as well. So that's for the Energizer ARC-5. So the episodes do sometimes have things in them that you're not going to hear me say, or you you couldn't possibly click on a link if I said it, right? So it's good to go to the website from time to time. Winterizing your RV. You know, there's... Two main ways that people do it. It's either blowing out the system with air or pressurizing the system with RV antifreeze. You know, either one of those ways will work. 
There's not a right or wrong way. Now, some people might think there's a right or wrong way, but there really isn't. It's just a matter of doing it either way and doing it right when you do it. You know, the problem when you fail to winterize your RV, you know, correctly is come springtime when you hook up the fresh water to it, you find you have a bunch of leaks. You know, maybe a faucet's broken. Maybe the toilet valve's broken. Maybe the ice maker valve's broken. You know, um, your outside faucet. So there's some things that can happen. Water filters, you know, if you have a uh, water filter inside the RV, you got to make sure that that's empty and bypassed. You know, there are some companies that sell bypass kits for their filters, but it might be easier just to bypass it yourself to make sure, you know, that it's, that it's not filled up. You know, so there's things that can happen. And so you really have to think outside the box. And before I get into this any further, when you are winterizing your RV, also look through the cabinets. And everywhere throughout your RV and make sure there's not things in there that can freeze that'll get ruined or liquid items that can expand and break the container there, they're in. And then on a warm day, it thaws out and creates a mess. So, you know, when you winterize your RV, you're looking everywhere inside the compartments, inside the RV, bathroom, take out anything that shouldn't freeze. And if you're not sure about it, just take it out, you know, just get a couple boxes, market RV and put it in the garage or wherever, someplace where it won't freeze. You know, that's um, a lesson that I'm sure everybody learns the hard way. So hopefully, you know, you can think about that, make that part of the winterizing thing. And also you want to go up on the roof and make sure that everything's sealed up there, that there's no water leaks. There's nothing worse than trying to fix a leak in the middle of the winter time, especially if you're in an area where it snows or rains consistently. You know, it makes it so hard to do. Check that out too. Make that part of your winterizing thing. And I know it's a little late possibly in some areas um, like here in Montana this last weekend we've had freezing temperatures sub-zero and you know there's a big rush on winterizing and so many people came into the store that just really didn't know what they had to do or that they even had to winterize it some of them their idea of winterizing was draining the hot water heater and that was it well that's a start but that's not it and so that's where that money comes in later on if you don't drain your water heater and it freezes and the tank breaks, now you're into this thing, you know, six, seven hundred dollars for a repair. Easy. Winterize it. You know, it, it takes a little bit of time, but it's well worth it. And being thorough pays off too. Now, if it's your first time winterizing, come springtime, you might have to replace a part. Maybe you miss something. But that happens. You know, I wouldn't overthink that. Oh well, you know, if a faucet breaks, a bathroom faucet, you gotta buy a new one. It's not the end of the world. You know, there's a lot worse things that could happen. Then you'll know next year, you know, to do it better. Maybe you just didn't do that faucet correctly and you think about it. Yeah, I didn't really do that one. I, I think I skipped that because I thought it would be okay. Whatever it is, you know, but the fact you're doing it yourself, you learn things and you learn how to do it, you know, year after year to pay someone to do this, it gets expensive. And also then they have to dewinterize it. And, you know, if they're using RV antifreeze, a little bit about a different game. So you can do this stuff yourself. So now let's get into this. Now I'm not going to go step by step. Well, I might go step by step. I'm not sure. But first off, to really do this correctly, if you're going to use antifreeze, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. Blowing out an RV for winterizing is pretty simple. You, know, you get the blowout plug. You put it into the city water hookup or city water fill. You know, basically where your water hose would go that's hooked up to a faucet. And the most blowout plugs, or you can get them with a chuck on it so you can hook it up to an air hose, which works real nice. And you're going to hook up air to it, and you want to keep it, you know, the water system is rated for like 60 pounds. It'll take more than that, but 60 would probably be the max. Water pressure regulators are set at 55 or approximately 55 PSI. You'd hook up the air hose to it after you have drained your water heater. And turn on the bypass. Hopefully it has a bypass kit on it. So now the air will bypass the water heater. And if you don't have a bypass kit on your water heater, where you, whether you're using antifreeze or air, it's easier to put one on and just, you leave it there. They're set up for permanent to where you can just go in there each year, turn a, turn the valve one way and that bypasses it. Then come springtime, you turn it the other way. And now the water heater is going to fill back up. There's actually two valves. And the same thing with the air. If you bypass the water heater, it makes it a lot easier. With the water heater not bypassed with air, it's going to make it really difficult to blow out the system. 
So the bypass kit should be on a water heater regardless, air or antifreeze. Is that how you're going to winterize it? Back to the air. So I guess I am going to go a little more step by step. <laughs> so now when you're working on your RV um, or doing this, you know, bypassing the systems or, I mean, uh, pressurizing the system with air is very important. So you, you pressurize the system and you're going to go to the closest faucet, just the same as you do with the antifreeze, open it up, let the water blow out, go to the next faucet, the next faucet, the next faucet until all the water comes out. And you want to flush the toilet because that opens up the water valve on the toilet and that'll blow the water out through there. If you have an outside faucet, don't forget about that. If you have a, a wash down faucet, don't forget that one either. So anything outside the RV that has water going to it, it needs to get this, the same thing done to it. The low point um, drains, if you have those, you want to open those up and make sure the water's out. But actually, as I said that, you would probably have already opened those or you should have opened those and drained the water out of the system to begin with. And that just eliminates that much more time you got to spend blowing water out. Don't forget to do that first. Open up the low point drains. Like I said, I don't have notes for all this. So you do that and then you just blow out the system until, you know, all the water comes out, you know, out of each faucet and then you're pretty much done. That's it. And, you know, doing this earlier in the season, let's say it's September 1st and you don't really think you're going to use your RV till next spring, do it right away, you know, cause you can actually just leave the faucets open for a couple of weeks and let any water drain out and go through those, get to the low point drains and check those one more time before you seal up the RV for the winter time. Gives you a little head start. Now I'm not saying you have to do that, but anything you can do to help just eliminates problems, you know, and then it also gives you peace of mind as well. That's it with the blowing out the system. That is sometimes easier to do than using antifreeze, but everybody likes doing it different. You know, some people like antifreeze, some people like air. I mean, we sold... I don't know, 40 cases of antifreeze in two weeks in our store because of the freeze that was coming. But we also sold out, you know, 40 blowout plugs for using air. So, you know, everybody has their own flavor of this. And I'm not pro for one or the other because either one of them will work. And for my RV, the antifreeze sounds like a better way to go for me. Just because it's something that's Oh, I can do it. It's not a problem. My water heater, I mean, excuse me, my water pump is very accessible. The water heater is very accessible. See, and that would be a thing too. If your water heater and water pump are very hard to get to, well, more so the water pump, then maybe you don't want to use the, the antifreeze and you just want to blow out the system. With the RV antifreeze, we're going to get on that now. Generally, you know, it's going to take two to three gallons of RV antifreeze. So you want to make sure it's RV antifreeze. Do not use automotive antifreeze. RV antifreeze is made for the fresh water system. It's food grade. So, you know, technically you could drink it, but I want it. Um, it's not going to kill you, but it's certainly not going to make you feel good. And if a little bit was left in the system, if you didn't get it all out when you de-winterize, it's not going to be the end of the world. So you, two to three gallons, you know, if you had four gallons on hand, unless you've done it and you know exactly what you need, if it's your first time, I'd have an extra gallon or so. Just in case, because you don't want to start, and then all of a sudden you got to stop, run to the store it's late in the day, and you can't get there. You know, it's easier just to do it all while you're there. So I would make sure you had extra antifreeze. You know, and the antifreeze can be stored; it doesn't go bad. You know, so you can put it in your uh, garage or wherever, and keep it to the next year, and then just add whatever you need to to make it work. But you know, keep track of what you use, and that way you can just buy that amount. You don't necessarily have to have extra. Although it doesn't hurt, like I said. So then you also want to have a water heater bypass kit. If you don't use one of those, the water heater will either use six or 10 gallons of RV antifreeze. So if you have a six gallon water heater, it's going to take an additional six gallons of antifreeze, RV antifreeze, if you don't have a water heater bypass kit. And a 10 gallon would be a 10 gallons of RV antifreeze. So a bypass kit's a, to me, a must. You know, why waste the money on the antifreeze? And it's just more antifreeze you got to flush out it, it, when you dewinterize. It's just going to take longer. And a bypass kit, you know, they're in the $30 range, $34, $35, maybe more, depending on where you're at, who you buy from. And by the way, all this stuff is available at your local RV store. There's nothing in here that has to be a special order or anything. If you live in an area where it gets cold, they probably have all this in stock, or hopefully they do. Some of these parts have been hard to get lately, 
we stocked up pretty good during the summer, so we're okay with them. But it still can be a problem for other stores who didn't plan ahead. So anyway, water heater bypass kit. It's a must. So before you go buy one, you need to know if you have a 6-gallon water heater or a 10-gallon. Then you go buy one, install it, and get a permanent one with the valves in it. They have some cheapy ones that's just a hose that you take on and off each time. Get the valves. So next year you can just close, open the valve for spring, close it for fall. You know, simple. And then now's a good time, too, to clean out the black and gray water tanks. So if you don't have a wand to do that or if your gray, gray and black water tanks don't have a flush system in it, you want to do that. Empty the tanks and flush them out really good. And then a water pump converter kit is another nice thing to have as well for doing this. And you can do it with a hand pump on the outside of the RV, but the water pump converter kit is a little bit easier. It hooks up to the water pump. But again, you know, if your water pump is really hard to get to, you might not want to do it. Or just if you're, you know, want to do it and you just buy out the time because it has a valve on it too. So you can leave it installed and then you just turn it off when you're done. And the next spring you turn it back on or, you know, flip the valve to the opposite direction for winterizing and not winterizing. It's pretty simple. And then it's on there. If you go to an RV store, you can look at one and you'll understand what I mean if you can't, you know, visualize that or if you don't have one. But they do make a a hand pump that you, basically the same thing, except you pump the RV antifreeze in from the outside of the RV at the city water hookup. And we actually sell a fair amount of those too. So it depends on the water pump and where it's at and and your skill level. You know, we had a older woman come in that, <laughs> she's a go-getter, man. And she just couldn't get the, the water pump thing. You know, she just couldn't get to the water pump easy enough. So she just says, oh, nuts to this. I'm just going to do it with the hand pump. You know, and she did it. And she did a good job with it. So, you know, that it is a nice alternative. And you might need a couple of basic hand tools to do this. A screwdriver, maybe a wrench, crescent wrench, pair of pliers. You know, nothing real heavy duty there. So there's quite a few steps to doing this. I don't know, 15, 16, something like that. But the steps kind of overlap, you know, from doing one to the next. But I'm going to kind of go through here. We have the time for it. So if your RV has a water filter inside, you want to remove the water filter or bypass it. And some of the water filters that have the canister, you know, you can get a little plate that goes in there on top of the, the canister itself. And you take out the filter, put the plate in, and then you tighten it back up and it shouldn't leak. And then it doesn't allow water to fill up that canister, which that canister holds, you know, quite a bit of water when it's empty, you know, a quart and a half, two quarts, something like that. So it just makes it easier. And you definitely want the water out of there anyways. You don't want it to freeze and filling it with the RV antifreeze just takes up more RV antifreeze, more time, you know. So we're trying to avoid that but you'd want to take the filter out anyway so just bypassing it makes more sense on my my rv i just took the water filter out completely and i just use an external one on the outside because the filter was a hassle to change and then by you know doing this during the winter time trying to winterize it was a hassle too so i just removed it and basically put a two filter system outside of the rv made it easier So you're going to want to make sure you take care of the water filter or filters. You know, look at your RV. What do you have for filters? Then drain the fresh water tank. And that should go without saying, but sometimes we forget things. Drain that fresh water tank. Then you also want to drain the black and gray water tanks, which I already mentioned. And some of those have a built-in flusher. Now's a good time to do it. You know, get it all flushed out, cleaned up. If you don't have a built-in flusher, use a hand wand type flusher. Valterra makes them, Camco makes them, other people make them. There are several different types for each, you know, for different various scenarios in an RV, but they work real well. Whichever one you get, they all work good. Then you're going to go outside your water heater, and water heaters sometimes will have pressure in them, and it's always just good to open up the pressure relief valve. It's that brass valve that screws in towards the top of the water heater, and there's a little lever on it. You know, all water heaters have them. Your home water heater has one of these. Relieve the pressure by flipping up the little aluminum tab or lever, and that'll let the pressure out, and some water might dribble out of it as well. But if you don't remove the pressure and you forget about that and you go to remove the drain plug or the anode rod, because you're going to have to do that to drain the tank, you're going to be in a big surprise. 
you know, that water is going to come flying out a hundred miles an hour, knock the tools out of your hand. You have an anode rod, you know, if there's a car part next to it, it'll go through the window of the car. Yeah. Maybe go through the window. But anyways, it'll cause some damage. And if your face is in front of it, you know, you're going to get all that gunk in your eyes and it won't be good. So relieve the pressure in the pressure relief valve. And then if you have an Atwood water heater, there's going to be a drain plug that you're going to have to remove. And sometimes that drain plug is a real chore to get to. Well, I shouldn't say get to, to get a socket on. Some Atwood water heaters are designed a little bit different. And it's a little bit easier, but um, Camco does make a tool. In fact, it's the type of tool you might already have. I know like a skill saw, you buy a new skill saw, it comes with a wrench that's flat steel and it's angled on each end in two different sizes, you know, for two different sizes. Well, Camco makes something like that for the drain plug. And I think the drain plug is three quarters inch. I'm not 100% sure on that, but it's a bigger size. So you might get the tool. It could be handy rather than trying to fight with it. And Suburban uses an anode rod. They don't have the drain plug like Ant or Atwood does or Atwood slash Dometic since Dometic did buy Atwood a while back. So if you have a Suburban, it'll be the anode rod. So you'll take that out and inspect the anode rod, and it might be a good time to replace it. Well, you know, if it, if it needs to be replaced. And now you're going to go inside the RV, and you're going to have to put the anode rod back in or the drain plug. You know, you're just draining the tank. If there's a little bit of water left in there, that's not going to be a problem. And now it would also be a good time to flush out the tank as well. So we're going to go back in the RV, open up the hot and cold side of each faucet, going to open the flush valve on the toilet. So that might be a little harder to do, open up the flush valve. And one way you can do it with some of the Thetford toilets, Sealand, you can't. Well, I guess you could. If you put something down the bowl of the toilet, just hold the that um, flapper open, the gate. That'll keep the water valve open so you can do that. Or just press on it and, you know, let the water come out. Either way, you know, open and close it a few times. And so if the faucet's open, you know, you, then you go outside and uh, open up the low point drains. Now, the low point drains, you're going to have a hot and cold or you should have a hot and cold. It might be a valve. It might be a PEX cap. There's different ones. So whatever it is, just open it up and let the water drain out. And you can turn on the water pump to help push some of the water out, you know, to speed it up. But you don't want to run the water pump any longer than needed to clear the lines. And so you've done that. So now you go back inside the RV and you close all the faucets, shut all the valves, you know, that you open for the above process of draining the system. So now you check your water heater bypass, make sure that it's set to, so it's going to bypass the water heater. You don't want it to fill up with RV antifreeze. And like I said, this saves a lot of RV antifreeze. So you definitely want to have one. Then your water pump converter kit, if it's not already installed, you want to get it installed now. It might be easier to do it after you drain the water lines. That way you're dealing with less water at the water pump when you're disconnecting the inlet side of it. The water pump kit is pretty straightforward. And you can also, you know, if you don't want to buy a kit, you can hook up a water line to the inlet side of the water pump. And just use clear tubing and make it long enough to run it out to the floor of the kitchen or bathroom, wherever the water pump's at. So you can put the tubing in the one gallon jugs of RV antifreeze. That's basically what you do with the um, RV or the water pe water pump converter kit. You're just putting that clear tube that comes with it into a gallon of RV antifreeze. So now that you've done that, you got the tube in the RV antifreeze, you turn on the water pump. And you do want to make sure there's no leaks where you hooked up the bypass kit or your temporary bypass kit. And so you turn on the water pump and then you open up the faucets one by one, but you start at the first, closest faucet to the water pump and you open up the faucet both sides. You can do one side at a time, you know, hot and cold until the RV antifreeze appears. Then you go to the next faucet, next faucet, next faucet, and you just do the same thing. But while you're doing this, make sure you're one down, gallon jug is not out of antifreeze. You know, may, maybe have someone watch it. So if it starts running low, you can say, hey, hang on. I got to, you know, put the hose in a new gallon of jug or gallon jug of uh, RV antifreeze. You know, you don't want to run out and get air in the system. Then you got to kind of start all over again. So having someone help you with that would definitely make sense. 
you know, go to the toilet and flush the toilet several times to make sure you cycle the water valve until RV antifreeze appears. And, you know, the, if you have an ice maker, you might have to check with the manufacturer to see how to do that, what their, their, what their take is on it. Now, that pretty much fills up the system with RV antifreeze. Now, your fresh water, or I mean, excuse me, your city water hookup that you have outside needs to be winterized as well. So you can do this two different ways. You can turn off the water pump or leave the water pump on. If you leave the water pump on, you have to do this with caution because the antifreeze will come spraying out. But you can take the screen out of the way where you hook up your water hose on the outside and there's a little um, valve in there. You just push the valve until the RV antifreeze comes out. And you can do this with the pump on or off. Um, depending on what the pump off might be a little bit easier. But either way, just be cautious. If the pump's on, you're going to have RV antifreeze spraying out at you. Just when you're all done, turn off the water pump. After everything's done, turn off the water pump and open up one faucet just to relieve the pressure in the system. And that's it. You're done. Your, your RV's basically been winterized as far as the fresh water system goes. Now, to take it a little bit further, you're going to take a cup of RV antifreeze and pour it down to each drain in the RV or in the sinks. So each side of the sink, pour in a cup. If it goes in a while, it's going to go in one pee trap. So whatever you want to do. Sometimes more is better to just to be careful. And then you can also pour it into the toilet and then flush the toilet and let it go through the toilet into the holding tank and you are set. Now, if you have an electric water heater, if yours is propane and electric, you'll want to make sure you've turned off the 110 volts to the water heater. Turn the switch off, I should say. That way the water heater is not going to run if you keep it plugged in during the winter time to Maybe let your furnace run or you keep the batteries charged, whatever you might be doing. But just make sure that water heater's off. Now, you want to make sure all your faucets are closed when you're all done here. And consult your owner's manual to make sure that there's not some additional step that needs to be done. Maybe for a washing machine that's in the RV, an ice maker, like I said just a minute ago. You know, if your owner's manual has anything else, then just follow those instructions. And some owner manuals might explain this a little bit differently. So look at that. You're going to find this stuff all over the internet, YouTube, everywhere. I have found a lot of things about winterizing, and a lot of it's good and a lot of it's not. So be very cautious. You know, use common sense here. Anything, you know, it gets 32 degrees, water will freeze, and water will expand and break things. You know, if you have a gallon of water in a, a six-gallon water heater, that one gallon will not freeze and expand enough to hurt the water tank. But you're still better off just draining it out. Why take a chance? You know, things happen. Now you're done. Give yourself a nice big high five. You completed it. Your RV is winterized. You know, you could actually get a little sticker right winterized on it and put it on the side window. You know, let everybody know. Now you just have to undo all that in the springtime, which that'll be another episode. Don't have time for that today. So, you know, like I said, every RV is a little bit different and... You know, check the owner's manual. There could be something that, you know, in there that just has to be done different. This is just to kind of get you going here, give you an overall view. And all of these notes will be on my website at RadioArizonaRV.com under episode number 76. And maybe somewhere else on the website, but definitely there. I'll probably put them on other websites as well because it's nice information. So that's it in a nutshell. So make sure you get it done. You know, this is something you have to do if you live in an area where it freezes. You know, in some areas it only freezes in January, maybe February. So it's might even be something you want to consider in those places for those months unless you have another way of keeping your RV warm. It just gets expensive if you let something freeze in the RV and then you got to replace it, especially if you have to pay someone to do it, you know, a $30 faucet repair that you can do yourself couldn't turn into $200 if you have to pay someone. So it's a lot cheaper to do this than pay later. You know, then you can all winter long. You got peace of mind. You don't have to worry about it. All right. So that's it. Episode number 76. And I forgot to mention something. Um, I'd like you to check out radio, Arizona, RV.com and go to episode number 75 and look at the energizer arc five power station it's an awesome product and there's a link there for more information about it as well and i've been using it now this is my third podcast my studio has just got i got all the stuff going on here and have it's just easier to plug into that 
So it's a great little thing to have around when you need 110 volts in a pinch. All right, so that's going to conclude this episode number 76 on RV winterization. And this is Eric Stark with Radio Arizona RV. And I want to thank you again for listening to the show.